Okay. Good morning, everyone, or uh, whatever time it is in your in your area. Uh, so welcome to the first interim Mimi session. Uh, we're right at the start time for today by my clock. So I think we can, uh, although I think we're still waiting for at least one of our presenters to join. Um, I guess while we're, so let's allow a little more time for people to join the call. Uh, in the meantime, we do still need a note taker for today's uh, session. So if we have any volunteers, we would greatly appreciate um, having somebody take notes. There we go. Thank you, Conrad. Very much appreciated. Okay, I'm going to get started with the chair slides. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, this is the first uh, uh, Mimi Working Group Interim. Uh, so first, we uh, ask everybody to make uh, to take note of the note well um, and, uh, and uh, be aware of all the ITF policies on uh, intellectual property and how we uh, run these meetings. I guess the mask policy is moot since we're all virtual today. Um, and with all that said, uh, our agenda for today is to uh, wrap up Eric Rascorla's presentation from back at IETF 116 on transport requirements. Uh, and what's not on this slide, late breaking development, is we also have uh, a deck from Raphael, Robert, and Conrad uh, discussing transport versus delivery service. Uh, all right, so are there any other uh, proposed changes to the agenda or objections thus far? All right, sounds like we're good. Uh, so with that, I think we can get started with uh, Ecker's deck. Howdy. There we go. Hello. So I think we were saying you'd start from slide here or the next one, Eric. Yeah, I think let's let's just I think do here maybe. Um, as I, I'm, I'm also trying to page in where we were at the last the last meeting. Um, um, also, I guess since we don't have, um, uh, so you know, I, I can't see people in front of me. I can just see, see, the, see the mic line. Tim, is, can, can you just cut me off or whatever? When it's when you, when I, I think we should do do what we did last time, where people want to talk, they should just get get, get to the line and talk, and and you should just like make a face at me or something. Like when I stop talking, and we and and I um, so I think you know the purpose is just to tee up the conversation, not for me to like just yak all the time. Um, so um, to, to go back to where we were, um, I think you know. Um, you know, people have used um, these messaging systems. Obviously, notice that there's a bunch of different modalities, right? And so, you know, SMS, for instance, you can, if I have your coordinates, I have your USC two four number, I can just send you messages, and they just show up on your on your system. Um, um, there are other systems where, um, you know, um, especially those that had a presence built in, where you actually can't really do anything until the other side consents, where you can basically send some sort of, um, you know, you can send some sort of message that says, "Hey." Um, you know, uh, I'd like to be part of your network. And, and, and as I said, back in like SMBP, we at least see presence information. Their presence seems to be no longer uh, de rigueur. Um, and, um, and then you can't send a message at all. And, and the presence message typically only is allowed to have some very narrow information, if any. Um, you know, maybe it says like, like the, maybe it's stereotyped or maybe, I mean, it simply said, I mean, you can like have one line um, um, uh, um, or whatever. Um, um, and then sort of, uh, and obviously, um, you know, the first category we know produces spam. Um, we know people, um, you know, having uh, the ability to send messages means people spam. Um, and um, in the last category, we also know um, is not is not a model everyone likes. Um, um, and um, there's sort of an intermediate set of categories, I think, um, that sort of um, to um, 
uh, to uh, the, the receiver looks like the third category, but the sender um, looks like the first, um, where um, you can send messages, but they're somehow quarantined until the other side uh, accepts, um, you know, uh, uh, your, your 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 membership request. Um, uh, related to this, um, I should observe, um, and I think this is also really relevant um, in JDR's uh, um, uh, proposal, um, is there's a similar set of questions around group membership addition. So um, most of this is not familiar with once you're sort of like adjacent to somebody, you can add them to groups without the permission. Um, but I think JDR suggested that maybe that's not what we have, want to have all the time. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have my own slides in front of me. So um, I think um, we have a next, do we have a next slide that is relevant to this, Tim, or is this off topic? Okay, good. Let's go back then. Um, so I think like, so yeah, if you can go back. Um, yeah. So I think I think you know, um, there there was a bunch of discussion last time about trying to balance spam um, uh, versus um, uh, uh, ease of use. Um, so I um, and I think at least I heard at least one suggestion that basically maybe support all these modes. Um, um, I think that the the probably the most relevant question is what mechanisms we need to build in Mimi in order to support the modes that we need to support. And so, if all you wanted was to be able to send messages immediately, then you don't need a consent mechanism. But if you um, if you uh, if you do if you have to support a consent mechanism, then you obviously need to build one. And then maybe you can still allow people to send messages immediately. But um, you may but then if you allow that, maybe you need other anti spam mechanisms um, other than just like consent flows. Um, so I think like you know. Um, uh, I, I think what we're, 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 where we were back in Yokohama is trying to get some sense of what people think is mandatory here, um, and in particular, what's mandatory, um, you know, in existing systems and what, which which modes we need to actually continue to support. Um, so I think that's probably um, the queue for people to get in queue if they want to. Yeah, please feel free to step up to to join the queue and ask questions, or assert your position even more even better. Oh, Pete, there we go. You're going to run the queue, right, Tim? Yeah. Go ahead, Pete. Willing to raise their hand. It seems like we've got to support all of these mechanisms. An SMS type mechanism for the first one seems utterly necessary, and there are systems that will not stand for other than mode two mode three sort of seems like it falls out of mode two and some systems are going to want to introduce a you know a local permission mechanism to say bob can say what he wants to do which one of these three i, I don't see any way out of doing a permissions mechanism Rowan, so, uh, Pete, sorry, you said you don't, um, you think that some systems do one and have to do one, or some systems do three and have to do three? I making sure I'm on. My claim was that some systems um, uh, have one and need to do one. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I so my opinion on this is that some systems have to do one and the set of requirements that we have are mutually incompatible with doing one and that those systems can go you know go and fix their systems because <laughs> they they're basically broken in a bunch of other ways and that you know like they basically don't do a modern im system they've right they've let do something else if you don't mind, uh, Ro and I just talking to each other for a moment here. I, I have systems which might say, for instance, um, we want the ability to anybody who is in our enclave, um, you know, if, if you know the identifier and you've logged into our enclave, then you get to send messages immediately. That, in effect, becomes sort of a quarantine system if you are able to join up with us. And I don't see that that's a bad thing to support. Um, yeah. I, I, I think uh, protocol-wise, it may end up simply being, um, well, you've got to, 
you know, basically do a system wide permission then, and everybody's got to give that permission up front. Um, but I, I think, you know, I think it may just um, decay into the other cases. Yeah, I, I think that the, the case that you brought up, I think that's a situation where Bob has already pre consented to talk to a group of people. And it's not, you know, Alice, who Bob hasn't, you know, doesn't know from Adam, can send a message to Bob immediately. I think that those are different, those are different cases and we need to treat them differently. And I don't think we need to support one. I think we need to support two and three. And I think we need to support three in the case where that consent has come ahead of time. The point I was going to make on this is uh, can uh, we not implement one um, effectively on the receiving side by two and three? That um, uh, if you have an implementation that chooses um, to automatically accept um, the inbound stuff, then that's fine. However, the actual protocol still has that concept of doing a handshake, and it could be an entire um, gatekeeper or third party who decides, like iMessage and WhatsApp do today, that they just always hit accept immediately. But that's fine. It doesn't mean that the protocol needs to special case it as a special mode. So I think it's absolutely fine to do two. You get three then as a subset of two, and then one as a you know, kind of special case if the client or the implementation chooses to auto accept. So I think what Matthew is saying is right mechanically, um, but I wonder if it's right requirements wise. And what I mean by that is that um, my impression is that the consent flow is a major part of spam suppression in a lot of systems. And, um, and um, that the, the question is, do we need to provide stronger anti-spam mechanisms um, in a system um, to make it viable in order to have a you know, a fire and forget YOLO mode like S like SMS has. Um, could, could we get away with weaker anti spam systems if if everyone has to consent first? And I just don't know the answer to that question. But I think that's an, that's that, that's so. I think you're right from a perspective. It's just this narrow piece. But does it, that basis make does it make it take, take, take out a whole new pile of work in order to do it? I just don't know. Um, um, that that's why that that's why with the question I was trying to ask about one. Um, I think one question to be nice to know would be, like. Like, do we have an inventory of what systems do what? Um, so I was like thinking about this. Like, iMessage seems to do seems to do um, one. Obviously, um, uh, um, my impression is Signal does one. Um, um, uh, I'm not sure about. I'm trying to remember what I think, I'm trying to WhatsApp does. I think WhatsApp may also do one. Um, 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 at least, or at least, it seems like some of them do things where you can just send, like, at least you can send an arbitrary message at least once, like when you ask for when they're asked for the, the joining. So I, I guess. It, 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 maybe, maybe I'm just volunteering to do this work myself, but uh, it seems like maybe we should go and like make an inventory of what people actually do um, in, case, in case in case we're missing a case. Um, or in case we discover, as I said, that we really do need strong anti-spam suppression in this sort of fire and forget mode. Yeah, I think I'm next. Um... I think the inventory would be useful. Um, I guess one thing to think about though is my impression is that some of the systems today do one because their objective is to like maximize the network effect within their own system, right? So like if any of, if you're WhatsApp and any user can message any other user, like this is actually good for you for growing the, the network, right? Whereas you might have the opposite preference if you're not actually that interested in interopping with other systems and therefore one becomes much less, it matters much less to you in an, in an interop case. So, I mean, I think, I, I think it, I think what people have said this far is correct that like you're going to end up with some mode where you need both one and two, but I just think we need to be a little careful about saying like, well, these are how the, all the systems work today. And so that need, that is what drives the requirement because I suspect um, the motivation for how they work today isn't necessarily the same in an interop world versus a non-interop world.
Um, so it occurred to me uh, as you were speaking, Eric, that uh, so Twitter DMs, for instance, Twitter direct messages, that is, they have a quarantine mechanism whereby like if you get a DM from somebody you've never spoken to before, they're put in like a special area of the UI and you have to like consent to receive them first. Um, but the nuance I see between that setting and say like Signal or iMessage is that um, like on a service like Twitter, I can go look up any user by like searching for them in the, you know, in, in, uh, on the website and then I get the handle at which to send the messages. Whereas something like iMessage or WhatsApp, I have to figure out like what is the number or what is the um, the identifier that they're using for this, right? So uh, point being that maybe the quarantine mechanisms for receiving messages are more valuable in the context of a service where there's some like public searchable index of all the users who are on there. Um, not that like getting somebody's phone number is necessarily an incredibly high barrier, um, but there's a difference. I don't know. It just seems to me there's a nuance there that's worth considering. I think I'm next. Um, so, yeah, I first, I would be in favor of supporting all three, designing something that allows implementing all three modes. I think there are good reasons in different cases for each one of these modes. To Matthew's suggestion of simplifying by saying three, a special case of three is one, where you have automatic consent. I like the idea of simplifying that uh, that way. I would just say. If, if we go with that approach, then we should, you know, consent has to be able to, we have to be able to give consent. However, we implement giving consent it should be also possible to do that non, you know, when you're offline in a sense, the consent should mandate Bob actually doing something actively online. Otherwise it kind of breaks down again when we try and get one as a default, you want to be able to start messaging people non-interactively, right? When they're not even online. So that's just something to, to keep in mind if we go with that approach. Rowan, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I think the only service that that does this without any form of consent is Apple. Uh, I think everybody else uses presence of, you know, of a number in a contact in an address book or, you know, any uh, any of a number of other things as as a form of consent. Um, and but I think Apple is the only one that actually has oh like you have an you have a phone number through Apple therefore we can send you know that's our form of consent um, and if you know if somebody has evidence to the contrary I'd be really interested to hear to hear that. So to me, I mean, the fundamental question is, how is this affecting interoperability, right? Um, certainly, you have to be able to recognize the status of a message that you sent to somebody and that it may not be delivered yet. So that, to me, is, you know, a critical interoperability piece. But, you know, in terms of these three, you know, I, I which one, you know, would the resulting work say you must support or which one, you know, would the resulting work say you must not support? Um, none of them seem like a candidate for you must support, um, but there may be one for must not, or there may be you know one uh, that is based entirely on security, right? So the real question is, which one would be considered insecure and vulnerable to protocol attacks or flooding and things like that? And you know that seems to be maybe only one, but if you're trying to work with interoperability systems that already that you you can't easily uh, change their existing implementation then really to me the only question is how do you recognize the status of something that you sent um, that hasn't been delivered yet? A point that I think Matthew made and also Joel made in, um, uh, um, is, you know, what are the protocol implications here? Um, uh, so I think one thing that um, has been sort of floated around is the implications of both discovery and um, and uh, um, key package access. So um, in particular, um, an important difference between two and three is, am I allowed to access your key package prior to you consenting? Um, 
And um, this, of course, ties into questions about key package exhaustion um, and, and things like that. And similarly, um, if, if we have if we if we're planning to implement, if we're planning to implement discovery, then there's also then this question of discovery also ties into consent. Um, uh, if you think that if you think it's not necessarily possible to discover somebody's um, you know um, system independent identifier based on the system specific identifier, um, and um, you know if you think about something like um, uh, now I'm trying to remember the, the, the spin, right? Where consent, uh, where, where consent and discovery are all jumbled up together, right? Um, I don't think that's what you want, but I just like um, I think that, 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 that what you know, like it is very tempting to kind of be like we can not, not take a position on any of this stuff and just kind of like implement like implement a consent mechanism and call it a day. But um, um, but I think but that has downstream effects, um, as I say, um, um, in the case of um, auto consent, like off, auto offline consent, like like Joel was suggesting, that it means the key packages have to be available um, prior, um, you know. Um, potentially at some level um, that doesn't involve user consent, um, 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 and, espe and especially um, if you want to allow people to send messages or quarantine to keep actually to be available prior to consent. Um, so, um, sorry, the, um, rather, rather the um, Joel's, Joel's point about discovery, Joel's point has in discovery more than the key package availability, rather. Um, but so I just think like, um, and I think like I think it's probably fine to like have key packages available basically without any kind of consent. And I think Roman's probably getting up to say that because um, I think we just like have a default one, don't worry about exhaustion. But um, I'm just saying we have to like make, we have to decide that's okay uh, if we're going to allow uh, if we're going to if we're going to allow people to f send messages prior to consent. Um, I, I just just one more thing. I think I think I am hearing that like we need to that, that people think we need to support at least two and three. Um, and it's and it's not clear to me that there's any material different. And given given the sort of points Matthew made about um you know uh, I think it was Matthew about uh you know system uh, um uh or I'm sorry, sorry I lost who it was um about you know some systems just are opt in by being part of the system um, um I guess it was Alyssa as well um then maybe like one just trusts to drop out of two so maybe I think may, I think maybe the answer to all, all this is like no we're not is um you know try to sum it up is well we're gonna assume discovery is out of band so we don't have to doing spin um at least for now. Um, um, so auto consent, so, so, so we don't have consent for discovery. Um, we're not going to get key package exhaustion. So we get three, so two works and then we end up implementing two and then three and two, three and one or two, in these cases of, of two, um, where, you know, three, one is two without, one is two with auto consent and three is two with like discarding any messages sent prior to like sent prior to, to, um, to consent. So maybe that is about the answer. And, and then, and then, as I say, I think that does mean, and, and then maybe that lets you, because for the points Rome was making, lets you kind of kick the spam can down the road a little bit by saying, well, you know, if you're foolish enough to set up a system that like is configured in way one, then you're going to build some spam mechanisms we don't have yet. Thanks. Yeah, that that sounds right in terms of the summary. Um, just responding to Rowan, and I know Rowan, you and I have already disagreed about this in the past, but I can't remember what the resolution was. Um, WhatsApp. Oh, is I think supports one. You don't have to be in anybody's contact list um, to send a WhatsApp message, and you see the you see the first message before you can block. Okay, I I, I don't think that's right, but that's an easy question. That's an easy question for us to find the answer to. I mean, tell me how to stop getting the people WhatsApp messaging me who want me to invest in their cryptocurrency uh, investment take, vehicle, and I'll be take them out of their address book. Take your phone number out of their address books. That's how. Dear God. Okay. Sorry that I. Sorry, it didn't have a nicer answer for you, but. <laughs> I mean that, but what I'm saying is like that's not a that's not a solution, right? Like. I mean, if they harvested my phone number from someplace, then effectively it's the same as one. It, it, it's still conceptually different from like the, basically you clicked, you know, you clicked on something when you got WhatsApp that said that you consented to, you know, people who had your number in their in their address book. Um, and whereas with Apple, you don't have any choice at all. Um, and uh, and that might change you know, with, with the DMA. And it means that it has to be a, it might be that it has to be a WhatsApp user that has that in your phone number and not a user from some other system, right? Which is yeah. also different. Okay, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Conrad. Sorry, just for the protocol, I could just suggested that we have like consensus more or less on options two and three with, but potentially enabling option one through 
uh, two and three uh, just for the protocol. Uh, should I write that down that way and we move on? Sounds like rough consensus. Nobody's jumping into the queue to object. So yes, I think that's the, uh, I think it's the resolution. Excellent, Final thank you. Record. Suggestion, um, but I just want to follow the sentence in the chat, which is um, that um, uh, Draft Rosenberg Transport um, has a separate mechanism for consenting to um, consenting, to, consenting to membership in groups. Namely, I can add you to a group, and you've got to be able to agree to that. Um, and I don't, I don't think we need that. Um, someone, someone thinks we need that. We should speak up um, because that, that would be, that'd be. I mean, not this difficult necessarily, but separate protocol mechanism. And so I think you know the. Um, uh, the, the uh, you know the, the model I have in mind is like once you're in my effectively my contact list I can add you to any group I want, um, um, and if, if someone thinks we need a separate mechanism for that like they should speak up because what we'll like to line out. Okay, Eric, should we move on to okay, messages sounds and channels? Good. Yeah. Next slide, please, I guess. Right. So there's there's been a bunch of back and forth in this in, in several venues um, about like the sort of uh, modalities of, of of we're supporting and and, and in fact about terminology, if um, if people have read um Travis's terminology document. Um, um so at least conceptually speaking, it seems to me that there are three separate like um, modes of operation these systems have. There's like one to one messages where like you and I are each other. They're like um, I think um, uh, we've been trying to decide what to call them, but ad hoc groups is like one possibility. Um, um, as I say, Travis has some new suggestions um, where we're like, these are messages that are like one to one messages, but they have more than one person in them, more than two people in them, right? Um, and what I mean by that is they are defined by the by the contents of the group. And so you cannot add a new person to the group without changing effectively the group. Um, and so like, you know, S like iMessage has this, um, um, so there's like Slack. Um, um, and then there's like what's called, and then people call it like channels or rooms or named groups, right? Um, where um, basically the contents of the group, the contents of the group can in flux, and people can can join, can can get, add and be joined, uh, add, and, add and leave without um, changing the content members of the group. Um, these obviously um, um, have some overlap conceptually, um, and Richard Barnes and, and Alyssa did some nice sort of surveys of like what the of what systems did and um, um, and how they worked, and it was kind of a mess. Um, um, so um, uh, I think you know I guess um, you know I think there's a sort of a terminology question, which is what terminology should we call these type of things? Um, um, and B, um, you know, would you be less important? And um, B, what we need to support conceptually um, in, in terms of the system? Um, and I think I think if I remember correctly, Alyssa and um, Richard had proposed that we should only support like basically uh, effectively one to one messages um, and um, and what I'm calling here named groups. Um, um, we should not try to support ad hoc groups because they, they were hard to like actually make any sense of. Um, uh, um, I mean, yet another question, by the way, is how we think things ought to behave um, for um, when there's a symmetry in terms of the group membership for one, even one to one messages. And what I mean by that is, you know, um, is say we have a case uh, where um, you know uh, where I, I, I initiate a message to you, and, like you know, we we are both on messaging systems A and B, and uh, you know and and I have an, and, and I have a message and, and I have and I have like an AA call um, or an AB call or my A to your B, and then you want to do your A to my B, like what happens or your B to my A, um, and the same thing is true with these name groups. Um, where basically you have the same group participants and should like this apparently um, like appear with one thing or two things. Um, like I say, for group for name groups, also, that was weird because for name groups, it's like quite, quite common to have two groups that are the same, exactly the participants. But for anything like even the one-to-one -one group where it's defined by the participants, it's weird to have a situation where, um, you know, where you and I are the two participants and yet we have two different groups, two different like contexts depending on, on, on who initiated this the, the association. Richard, are you in the queue, I think, or you're going to be? So I don't know much more to say about this, but it sounds like we need to like come down and add. Yeah, I don't think I hit the Q button, but sure, I'll, I'll, I'll ad hoc join the Q. Uh, if I can verbally join the Q. Um, yeah, so just to recap what, what I could, um, mentioned, Alyssa and I did a brief kind of ad hoc survey of, of a bunch, you know, whatever we had installed on our phones. So it covered like iMessage and Slack and WhatsApp and a few others. Um, and 
tested a you know this uh, a kind of standard set of things you know what happens if i join and leave what happens if i try and set up a second group dm with the same set of people and <clears throat> on basically none of those questions was there any consistent behavior so i think that, that's kind of what led us to be uh disinclined to try and address this group dm case uh in in me because there doesn't seem to be any coherent model of it across the different messengers I mean, ideally, we, we I think we could get to, to one basic primitive here, you know, a a room of some sort um, with one to one, and you know, maybe some sort of group DM construct as a specialization of that. My understanding, and the, uh, folks who are more experienced in this dimension should um, correct me here, but my understanding is that that's how it's how things are implemented in at least some messaging systems. Um, that the the basic construct is. A, a group construct, and then it gets specialized when you need things like uniqueness, like one to ones, uh, are established as a a two member uh, group thing, um, and you just have some uniqueness enforcement that uh, means that if you try to create two of these one to ones, then you can't do that. Um, so my my inclination would be just to like pare down the number of modalities to so hopefully one, um, maybe maybe groups plus one to one, but, but definitely not trying to group, do this group DM case. Um, yeah, I fully agree with what uh, Richard just said, uh, and I'm wondering to what extent we actually uh, need to look into this further, because um, that's what we have with MLS now, where essentially everything is a group, and that can be specialized in one-to-one in -one or in, in any other uh, configuration you want, and that was informed by what messengers did at the time, so it was not Greenfield project, um, so... Um, I'm wondering if it's not good enough to agree that we have this abstract concept of a group that has a clear identifier, like some sort of UUID, and that has a clear set of, of members. Whether or not they can join or leave um, is a detail that comes on top of that concept, um, but the underlying thing is always the same. Um, that would be my proposal here um, to get it started. And if, if later on we feel that this is not good enough, then we can always try to add something to it. Jonathan, go ahead. Okay, not sure if Jonathan's having AV problems. Perhaps we should move on to Rowan then. Hey, um, yeah, I think <clears throat> the I agree with the previous speakers that this is that if we represent this as a, a single sort of room, uh, that we have ways that we can make these different behaviors apparent. But I think many of these things are um are actually handled well by um by treating this as an authorization problem of whether you're authorized to you know whether a member of a group is authorized to add another participant for example um and um and i think that uh and i and i will say that you know wire is implemented in this way and um and xmpp uses primitives that that sort of rely on this kind of authorization uh, style model. Yeah, I'm basically going to say the same thing as Ron, but from the matrix perspective, um, the uh, at least the way the matrix does it is that you have a single primitive, a room, and that room can be configured via its um, access control to either act as a one-on-one -on -one or as a ad hoc group um, or as a named group to use um, Eka's terminology there. The thing that scares me more is um, interrupt with existing systems. I think iMessage is the famous one where um, if you try to create a new group conversation with the same end set of people under the hood, it is literally the same um, ID IDs used. So you just cannot have multiple conversations with the same set of end people. 
whereas obviously in a MLS backed Mimi matrix um, or even XMPP world, uh, you can have multiple private conversations with the same set of N people. I'm assuming that we are all collectively assuming that um, for something like that, Apple would have no choice that if they want to operate with Mimi, that they need to fix the semantics of their client to support um, that flexibility. But it is worth noting that it would be a pretty fundamental change, I suspect, um, for some folks who have made that assumption. Actually, just a quick, quick point of, of, of fact. Um, iMessage was one of the systems that Ellis and I tested, and I think we were able to create multiple uh, conversations with the same set of people. I think that was one of the surprising results, in fact. Um, but yeah, there are now like three conversations with me, Alyssa and Ecker on, on my phone and my iMessage queue. Interesting. In which case, I'm going on data from about 18 months ago. Um, yeah. where, and I dug into it at the time and it turned out that they were uh, the way they were doing group conversations was literally just to send a whole bunch of one-on-ones and then present it in the UI as a group together. Yeah, I'm not sure how they're doing it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other systems that, that do have that property. So like in Slack, if you create a group DM among a group of people and, like you, and you try and create it again, then you'll end up in the same one. And even if you leave the group DM, uh, you're you're not actually evicted, and um, if you uh, you can then re get re-added and rejoin, and it's the same thing. It's 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 odd, which is you know th this is this, these oddities are part of why I was proposing like let's not go down this path. I mean, so sorry. I, mean, I think it certainly is true that like the most general modalities, sort of whatever you want to call these named groups, were like that were like the. There's there's no necessary relationship with the members of the groups and the um um and and, uh, and the identity of the group um and then that the systems tend to bolt on some abstraction that, that, pretend, that pretends that's not the case um, on top of it um I, I do think going back to the requirements question um you know is there some um you know there's a there's a certain conceptual assumption um in a number of these a number of these drafts like like for instance draft Rosenberg that the, that the chats are hosted somewhere um and so um um and and so uh. Uh, you know, it is weird of a situation where, um, uh, you know, are, are we, are we going to, are we going to build mechanisms or having things that encourage or whatever that, that even in these one-to-one -one chats that like, you don't, you don't create a new group, um, when you have exactly the same members as before. Um, cause I think it is pretty gross to have a situation where it's like, what, what it was like, WhatsApp and iMessage. And when, and when I go to create and I, you know, when I go to create, when, when iMessage goes and creates the thing, then we have like a single chat. And then the person from WhatsApp, which like, you may say, why didn't they just pick the one that was already in their list, but they don't, they've forgotten. And so they do something to try to create the group. And now you have like a separate chat that is like, what is, what's up? Like it's hosted on WhatsApp and talks to iMessage and it's exactly the same, the same two people. That seems pretty nasty. Um, even if we don't solve like the group problem. Um, so I think, you know, maybe we should want to live with that, but I think I'd like to hear somebody defend that like user interface. And if they think that user interface is like cool, then okay. But if they think that it's not cool, then like, I'll probably do something about it. And I think um, to, to credit, you know, John, Jonathan's draft does in fact try to think to say about this as I recall. Um, but I think like, like, is that like, is that an acceptable state of affairs to have people experience? So I'll go ahead. Um, so yeah, I think one of the lessons we, we learned at wire is if we, we had, a, we have ad hoc groups, if we had a choice, we'd go back and not do it. So uh, my, my personal take is name groups and one-on-one -on -one messages, and that's enough. Ad hoc groups are confusing for people. Um, to Raphael's comment about whether we should even be talking about this because MLS just does name groups, I think for interop, yes, I think it is important that we agree on the modality because otherwise, you know, if the behaviors of how the rules that two different providers, you know, impose on the, on the modalities don't sync up, then I don't see how interop can, can work. Things can go really wrong. So I think it is important for us to agree on these modalities for real interop. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is Rowan was, was commenting that a lot of this can sort of boil down to access control in an MLS group. I think for that's true for name groups, implementing ad hoc groups. Not that I, like I said, I don't think we should have ad hoc groups, but I think that works. I think what, what doesn't work straight up for MLS, um, out of the box MLS is the, the um, well, 
okay, for one-on-one -on -one messages, you expect to only have, I would expect to only have one one-on-one -on -one message. In a sense, it's maybe a special case of an ad hoc group. That, I don't see how you could do that with MLS because MLS doesn't say, there's nothing about when you create a group that, that allows you to you know, depend on the existence of other groups that say, oh, now you can't create this group because there's something else, some other group that has some other state. You know, that would be something that's a layer up that requires some statement, like some notion of identity and which has users and blah, blah, blah. So I don't think access control completely solves the problem here, like sort of vanilla MLS access control, or maybe Rowan just understands a different thing under that term. But yeah, so those are, those are my takes on what's been said so far. Sorry, can I just ask you one, one question for clarification there? So um, you're saying that you, you think it's acceptable that Mimi would define the, you know, the further constraint that gets you a one-to-one -one message or, or a one-to-one -one, uh, chat that, where you can never add a third user? Yes, yes. I mean, I think it's, I think one-to-one -one messages is widely sort of accepted, like as in there's a lot of precedent for that. Users understand that. Um, I think that's a, that's a, that's a well understood concept. And I would I would be in favor of supporting that. I do think it's a bit okay. of a mess. Which, what Eric was saying, like if I have a bunch of one on ones with with the same person and they're not like named groups for a specific topic, I think that does become a bit of a mess. So yes, I'm in favor of Mimi defining generally named groups, but as a special case, yes, there's this concept of a one on one message that at the MLS level, yes, sure, it's treated as a named group, but higher up the stack of what we define, it behaves like the special case of an ad hoc group for two people, something like that, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, JDR. Sorry, is it me or, or Jonathan? It is Jonathan, but I suspect he's having problems with his microphone. Or with okay. the echo. Uh, uh, yeah, so I don't see any I buttons for me to press. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, the 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 thing that um, uh, I so to jo Joel's point, I think that this is this authorization at a um, at the Mimi protocol level, not at the MLS level, and that the the semantics for one on one or for ad hoc, I think, is that. If you have a um, a fixed uh, a, a fixed um, membership group, and if you have a fixed membership group with a with no name versus a fixed membership group with a name, a fixed any fixed any fixed membership group with a name will resolve to an existing fixed membership group. Uh, with no name. So if you try to create a fixed membership group with no name, and then again, try to create another fixed membership group with no name, they will match and they'll be the same group. That's how I, that's how I treat the one-on-one -on -one case and how I, how we can treat the behavior of ad hoc groups, you know, with the same membership, if that's what you want and ending, ending up together. And if you don't want them together, well, you could just create a unique name for each one and then they won't collide. Testing one, two, three. Can anyone hear me? That works. Go ahead, Jonathan. Oh my God. It's entirely Cullen's fault, by the way. A device selection in WebRTC is just total trash. Um, all right, what I was gonna say is I, I think there's an overarching guiding principle that I like to use when thinking about these requirements, which is, will the gatekeepers adopt this? And if we had a protocol that didn't support the primary mode of group messaging that that gatekeeper had, then the answer is definitely no. And so in the case of iMessage, which in my opinion is like pretty much the number one like thing that this is, is a gatekeeper, um, they have this mode, right, of this group messaging. And if we don't have any way at all to, for that to work, then I just think it sort of defeats the purpose of doing this Mimi exercise. So my opinion is 
we probably need to support a ver some version of the whatever primary mode of group communication is supported by all the gatekeepers. I think from a protocol, that's my requirement statement. So I think we need this idea of ad hoc. I think from a protocol perspective, it can be supported by, as others have pointed out, you know, the protocol itself only understands the concept of a named group and we just we just treat an ad hoc group as like by by hashing the participants and mapping them to a named group. So each set of unique ad hoc participants maps to a singular named group. And then as others have also commented in, um, you know, adding and removing people would just cause you to move to another group. And um, but at least we would we would support like the primary use case for iMessage multi-party chat, which I think is a pretty important thing to do. Um, so that's my opinion as I, I do believe this is a requirement. Uh, we don't have to support complex variations on ad remove, which is not as commonly used, but we should support the common use cases. Thank you. So I think I may be in a sort of similar position to where Jonathan's ending up at the end of that. Um, it seems to me like the primary difference between named groups and either one-to-one -one or ad hoc you know, group DMs is this uniqueness property. Um, and so, and, and otherwise the group mechanics can probably be, be the same, how you join or leave a group, how you set one up, how you send messages within a group, et cetera. Um, so I, I think basically what I'd like to propose mechanistically is that we, you know, we agree that like, in terms of the an actual live thing once it's set up, you know, we have one thing, which is which is a group um, of folks communicating, whether that's two people in one on one, whether it's a deep group DM, whether it's a, a named thing. <clears throat> As we're on point out, there's different policies you might attach to this in terms of who can join and leave. But the only the only difference between that thing and the the one on one or group DM cases <clears throat> is this unique <clears throat> uniqueness property. I think that directly gives us one to one support because the uniqueness question in one to one is, is very easy to solve. Like when you get a request to make one of these things, you see if it exists with the other side. And if, if so, you use the other sides and off you go. Um, so I think we could kind of do this stepwise, you know, solve name groups first, then solve uniqueness to create one on ones because that seems straightforward. And then eventually get to you know, group TMs if that seems to folks want. Jonathan, go ahead. Yep. Um, so yeah, I think, well, I, I think I like the idea of them all being named groups sort of, you know, at the protocol level, what it is. I think there needs to be some, I mentioned this on the chat, that uh, some uh, notion of sort of the higher level semantics that the user is intending. Because, you know, as I mentioned, it would be very bad if I do something that I intend to be a one-to-one -one chat and the other person on the other system doesn't know that that's meant to be a one-to-one -one chat. So they see that as a invitation to a named group named UUID ad hoc group, Jonathan and Eric. That would be a terrible user experience. They want, the other side should know this is semantically intended to be one-to-one -one chat or a group chat and you can't add people. So I think um, there needs to be enough such that the endpoints can agree on what the, you know, you know, give the same user experience and give, you know, insofar as they distinguish the user experiences of these different things, and hide, you know, irrelevant protocol details and get um, to the endpoints. So um, that may be sort of some layer on top of the named groups semantic at the protocol layer, but I think it needs to exist. So um, just responding on the, on the point about iMessage, um, I think in order to be able to support ad hoc in the way that iMessage already supports it, the, that behavior would have to be well understood. And uh, just as a, as a user, it's like very hard to understand what the actual model is on the back end uh, for the way that they're handling ad hoc groups uh, based on, you know, experience with it, right? So like, uh, the same group of people and and adding and, and leaving. And I I get like the appeal of saying like, well, we just like wouldn't support the 
complex uh, join and leave use cases, but how does that actually work in practice? Because like once you once you put it out there, then like indeed like you'll have a group and somebody will leave and they will try to create a group with um, you know with the same set of participants and then try to like rejoin the previous group and then like the the protocol has to say something about what happens in that case. It can't just be silent. Um, so I don't I don't actually see like the a straightforward path to to saying like you know whatever iMessage supports today like we have to be able to support because um, I think honestly it's like a little bit broken the way that it that it works today. So I think the the path that Richard laid out makes more sense to me and 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 with time like it, it might become more obvious like which of the ad hoc um, behaviors make sense to support. But I think trying to sort of deduce it. Um, for the purposes of of baking it into into the protocol will be very difficult. Joel, go ahead. About, yeah. Hey, to uh, Jonathan Lennox's comment about um, you know uh, sort of what's the clear semantics way like a way of implementing this with clear semantics so that uh it's easy to recognize i i actually was thinking rather than the sort of the hashing of the usernames uh just an mls extension that sets like fixes the modality of the group explicitly you know as an extra property say a group extension or something like that and then it's like crystal clear you just look at the group context and you can see what the modality is Ecker, do you want to summarize where where you think we got to? I can try. Sorry, am I the only one not hearing anything? Uh, Ecker, I think you might have muted yourself. That's too bad because what I was saying was like really smart. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the best way I can sort of try to like gloss across all this is that I think what I'm hearing is the fundamental primitive ought to be what I've been calling name groups, which is to say, um, and then there ought to be some, there ought to be, and then we need probably two extensions, one way to have a deterministic name from uh, from the participants in the group, so that um, um, and one way to indicate that the group is essentially immutable, um, and that if you have those two, then you can emulate um, ad hoc groups with one to one and one to one groups with named groups. Um, and I think this, like, I think this roughly ties in to like Rowan to what Richard was saying about hashing and what Rowan was saying about uh, the access control. Um, and um, and I, and I do think that will um, that that does that does imply um, and 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 maybe you need some other extension about like that says uh, I really think that like that if, when you try to do things in the opposite direction they should end up the same way, um, um, but they, that but that may just may just drop out of the, of, of doing the, of doing the hashing and, and the uniqueness. Um, so um, so I think probably there's something something here, but I think it would also help if somebody actually wrote down and maybe it may Richard be willing to like write down kind of like how, how to do what I think he's saying. I'm just picking Richard because I thought he he seemed to have the, the, the sort of most completely worked out theory, but maybe Roman also never worked out theory, so maybe they do it together or something. If nobody has done it by the MLS workshop, I will take a stab at it. Or who who was that? Just so we know how how to note. That was Rowan. Oh, good. Okay, sorry. I I, I couldn't I couldn't help. Um. Awesome. Should we move on? Uh, I think this is the same topic, right? Uh, yeah, maybe the same slide. Um. Yes, it's the same topic. Yeah. Um. Uh. So yeah, next slide. 
Um, so I think this is, um, uh, this may actually be much easier, hopefully. Um, so if you look at like um, MUC, uh, MUC, MUC and Matrix, they have like quite a complicated like room management apparatus um, with like, you know, ownership, room ownership and, uh, and like Matthews made this hierarchy of ownership, um, you know, moderation, kick ban, asking to join tasks, et cetera, et cetera. And like lots of systems don't have that at all. Um, and this is out of charter scope um, for uh, for the charters I read it uh, for us to build a new thing here. Um, and I think the assumption that I've been hearing is that this only works um, this, this, this does maybe work, but only that, that, that any, any given chat is owned on, on one, uh, on one service. And if that service, of course, will have its own apparatus for doing this. And that, you know, so if you like, if I chat that's hosted on matrix, then the people who are on matrix can do like, can own and moderate and kick ban and whatever. But if like, I'm on, if I'm on WhatsApp, then I don't get to like do any of that shit. I'm like, I'm not chatting by matrix. Um, and, um, and so, like that means that it's all the, all the apparatus is private rather 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 than interoperable in public. So I think that was that was what I heard being discussed privately. So maybe people, uh, maybe I misunderstood this entirely. Eric, I want to, I want to interrupt. We have uh, Matthew and Rowan in the queue, I think, to respond to that. Go ahead, Fantastic. Matthew. Um, this is one <clears throat> that um, <laughs> I, I think is a real hornet's nest because if we let every different implementation of basically every hub or owner server come up with its own access control system in terms of who's allowed to kick who and are you allowed to speak if your name has an M in it and <clears throat> whatever other random rules, first of all, it's going to be impossible to expose the admin controls to any given app in the room because all the apps will have different ideas of the semantics of the room. But secondly, you won't be able to ever move the owner around. So if the owner server goes bang, and you want to have some scope in future for moving ownership around, or if you, heaven forbid, want to decentralize control over the room, I really, really, really think it's useful to have a common language, not a heavyweight one, but at least some basic way to decide um, how room management should work um, defined in the protocol. And if it's ended up being out of charter scope, I'm terrified because um, how are you going to be able to admin and configure these rooms um, from a given client if you don't have some protocol to define how room management works? Yeah, um, pretty similar to Matthew's comment. But I mean, the way that I'm going to express this is that we should define the semantics of all of these things. And then we can come up with a list of things that you must do and a way to, to, to figure out whether everybody else supports any of these other semantics. Can you guys hear me this time? All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I go back to my fundamental theory of how to make decisions and requirements, which is if it's not there, will the gatekeepers adopt it? Um, and so uh, this is one where I think the, the feature set and the, the main gatekeepers are primarily consumer. I think have much smaller feature sets. So I, I do think we should just focus on doing a minimum that would allow that to interoperate. I know there are people on this call. I know Matthew and all are, are, are interested in, in a bigger, in, you know, in doing beyond that. I appreciate it. So that's going to be where we, we are, we're going to find uh, difficult decisions need to be made. But I, I think we need a minimum set that maps to the uh, capabilities of the um, uh, the the gatekeepers. The second thing I would say is what definitely needs to be in scope in all cases. If you attempt to do an operation. That you're not permitted to do like the protocol to support rejecting because you're not allowed to do that so if there's a like add person api and i'm not and i'm and i'm not it's only possible by moderators whose name is eric and and i'm not such a person like i may not know that that's why i'm being rejected but i should be rejected and know that i didn't have permission to do something so as long as we can express errors due to permission problems for all operations we support we at least have some ability for the systems to work together even if we don't expose the full set of ownership moderation and other functionalities outside of the owning organization. So I, my, in conclusion, I think we need a minimum set that maps to the consumer gatekeepers and we need a capabilities in the protocol to express rejection because of lack of authorization. Yeah. Um, so to the extent that 
we need to deliver something that works for all the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers do a bunch of different things, which is, you know, a fairly large subset of the things that Muck and Matrix know how to do. Uh, now, if we were complete de defining from scratch completely new semantics, I would agree that we shouldn't go and define those semantics. But they're already defined, and we know that they already like represent real conferences in a bunch of different systems and can be used to model these all. So rather than starting from scratch and having to go through a full requirements process and define new semantics, let's use semantics that already exist. And we require the ones that that our customers require, which, you know, if, you, if we're using the gatekeepers need to be able to do the things that they can do now, then that's the list of things that the gatekeepers can do now. And if, by the way, as a bonus, if other people decide, if a gatekeeper adds a feature and another gatekeeper adds the same feature, they can already model that onto existing semantics and it will just work. So I think I was nesting queue, um, although I suspect I'm about to say the same thing Alyssa is, is Alyssa posted in the chat what the um, language around this uh, was, which, um, uh, which I think um, you know uh, may in fact prohibit much of this. So I think it'd be useful if people think that what they're asking for is consistent with the charter, um, um, uh, or if they think that the charter needs to be changed. <laughs> um, um, and um, so I think that'd be that'd be a useful place to start because if it's changed charter um, to do this work, then we have to get on that. Right. Yeah. So um, one thing is that I think. Not everything on your list here is uh, necessarily in the same bucket vis-a-vis -vis the charter. Um, in particular, I think this the kick ban uh, is to me is like kind of a distinct um, consideration from at least from ownership and, and moderation, um, and also like a very critical consumer feature. Um, I mean, both consumer and enterprise feature as opposed to the other two, which are um, more like enterprise features, in my view. So um, so that's one thing to think about um, that maybe maybe we we treat different ones of these differently. Um, and we've already spent kind of some time talking about, you know, blocking uh, users and, and reputation and whatnot. So I do think that one's a different case. Um, the other thing is back to the prioritization, like even if people want to start some conversation about like rechartering to be able to do this, uh, like what are the implications for the rest of the, the protocol suite um, of not addressing the, the um, administration features straight away? Like are there actual dependencies? Because if there aren't, then um it's not to say that these things aren't important but they're just not they just weren't in the original you know the first phase of what was going to be designed here and there are a lot of other things that are in that first phase that are really hard and uh and we need to make progress against so i think we need to prioritize and um if there's not much in terms of uh design implications for the things that are in phase zero then uh, we can we can say that um, the ownership and moderation are important, but we'll, we're going to address them in in phase one or two, um, and without you know without creating problems for ourselves down the line. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to speak to the last point that Elisa just brought up. Um, so yeah, whether or not we need to recharter is an open question, I guess. But um, I don't think this uh, is an obstacle for now because whatever it is that we might want to agree on here is probably something that mechanically, again, is on a different layer and can be built on top of MLS, uh, where we just use the, the group agreement that we already get for free um, to agree on you know arbitrary state that that's uh, we might want to standardize. Um, so my feeling is it's OK to uh, not solve that problem right now, like Alyssa just suggested, and then move on and figure it out later. Um, we're not going to break anything necessarily.
Anybody think that we have to do this today or that we can, as it says, kick it down the road a little bit? I think it's um, a risk of a really bad user experience. Right? If we're saying you can't even name a group chat um, for now because that's considered complicated room management, um, then that would be a real uh, uh, mess. Um, I, I'm finding it quite hard to actually understand what we're defining is in charter scope. Okay, so Jonathan says in the chat that naming um, should be in scope, but then um, who, who has permission to name? If it's a group, surely you then need the concept of an admin because you don't want like a hundred person group and somebody starts going and renaming it something abusive, blah, 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 at which point, hey, presto, you need to have some kind of um, permission management system in there. Uh, it, it almost feels like we need to, uh, this isn't black and white, surely we need to have a matrix of the different functions and see which ones we think are in scope and which are out of scope for the charter. I'd be quite happy to drop a grid if that helps. Yeah, I think that would be useful. Maybe even, yeah, just a list of them. Cool. Okay. Are we moving on? I think so. It was empty, so I think so. Next slide. Okay, so um, the uh, um, this gets back to like another conceptual issue. Um, there, um, uh, in <laughs> all but one of the proposals that I've seen here, um, there's a general assumption that the room, whatever the channel, whatever it is, lives on one system, um, and um, um, and except for matrix. Um, and so um, I think it's, um, and so like, uh, you know, uh, for instance, in, in, in Jeff Rosenberg, um, you know, the idea is that if, if, if I, you know, if I'm on WhatsApp and I create, and I create a room um, and I add, you know, and I ask someone for my message, um, that room lives on WhatsApp. And, um, you know, if I decide, and, and if it's just, if, if it's, you know, me and four people for my message and I drop out, um, then the room just like blows up basically, or, or maybe either blows up or like, um, I message or like WhatsApp is just required, like continue to like run it indefinitely, but without any WhatsApp users or something like that. Um, but it's like something you know, not administrate it anymore probably cause they don't own it. Um, and, um, um, uh, so, um, matrix and linear matrix, uh, does not have this concept really, um, uh, as much. Um, and linearized matrix, um, as I understand it, and have you prefer to correct me, um, allows, um, uh, you know, uh, channels to move, um, between, uh, between owning systems. Um, and, um, so I think, uh, you know, we really have to determine whether that, that, that's something we want to do or not. Um, as I said, I think my understanding is that, mo that sort of general sense of the group was they didn't want to do it, but, um, um, but, you know, we didn't actually discuss it. So who knows what people actually think. Um, so I guess I, I think now would be a good time to have that discussion. Um, and Jonathan, I'm sure you're going to want to weigh in too. Uh, I just don't, I don't see you in Kiev, but, um, um, I guess um, I can jump in first in the queue. Um, so, <clears throat> first of all, agreed that um, for Mimi purposes, matrixes, room replication is overkill. And as I said in Yokohama, you know, we've had a, a epiphany with the linearized matrix stuff that is basically possible to have something that is compatible with matrixes semantics without going and replicating the rooms everywhere and having that complicated merge resolution algorithm that we have called state resolution. And that is what linearized matrix is. Um, but because, um, ironically, because uh, you end up um, having well-defined semantics about group administration in terms of who's an admin, who's a moderator and all that stuff, and you get it for free, it does mean that you can pretty easily move the hub around the place. And I would argue that's a really valuable thing because not only does it solve the problem from the previous slide that um, you get a set of consistent semantics for um, administration stuff um, and it doesn't matter what uh, where the hub is, it doesn't matter, say, what server a given user was on when they created the conversation, everything's always going to behave the same. Because the thing that I'm most worried about 
on um, uh, no, the previous slide, say the naming thing, and the example that Jonathan gave in the chat is that somebody can try to set the name of a group, and one hub might give one answer to that, and the other might give a totally different answer. I would say that's a horrible bug, because as a user, I don't want to care whether this group happens to be hubbed off WhatsApp or iMessage or whatever. I expect to be able to try to do an operation and have a consistent response rather than exposing that mess to the user. So the ability, uh, having codified enough of the really basic minimum viable semantics for group admin, for things like naming and access control, means that you can move the hub around the place, um, even if you don't do it in the first step. And it also means that if a provider goes bang, um, no, you lose connectivity to the internet, it, it turns out that some massive group chat ends up being um, hubbed off some Raspberry Pi somewhere from somebody who's enthusiastically requested an interop with WhatsApp or whatever it might happen to be, then you don't destroy the conversation integrity because somebody else can take it over. And it also doesn't close the door on decentralization. I appreciate this is a, possibly a bit of a holy war thing, but I really think you can have your cake and eat it here. You can have something that is super simple to implement, has minimum viable semantics for access control, and allows you to port the hub around the place without something that's really complicated. And the linearized matrix ID is trying to concretize that without any dependencies on the existing matrix prior art, but just doing it standalone, complete with the working implementation to show that we shouldn't be scared about doing it that way. Sorry for the rant. Um, yeah, I think what I want to say is very similar, actually, and also similar with what um, Jonathan wrote in the chat. Um, I think it's hugely important um, to have that property, to have portability. Uh, my lawyer also brought it up um, at the ITF in Yokohama. And um, however, I think it's one of those things that we don't have to do immediately uh, and instead try and design the transport and delivery service in a way that it doesn't preclude us from doing that. And I think that would fit what Matthew just said. Um, and possibly that would also be compatible uh, with what we are proposing with the delivery service. Um, well, I guess Jonathan can say to a degree it would be uh, workable with the um, the Trantos protocol. But so, yeah, to summarize, it is important. We should eventually have it. Uh, for now, we should only try and not actively prevent it with whatever we do next. Yeah, just to agree with Rafael, my point, uh, I would be perfectly happy as long as we don't design it out. What's a disaster is if you design with the assumption that all the hubs have completely different behavior. Um, yeah, so my, my worry is that the reality is all the hubs ultimately will have different behaviors. I mean, again, if we were starting from a system that was greenfield, it would be different if we were, you know, starting with a system where everyone was running a common code base or derived from the same protocol, like, like matrix system is where you can have this idea that it's fully portable and okay, but we're, you know, it's going to be different from vendor to vendor and that's, that's the reality. In order for this to be portable, we would have to support the superset of all the functionality and also, um, you know, make the assumption that the portability of the chat is something that the gatekeepers even sort of want to do. Um, it's unclear to me that anyone, anyone really wants to do that. Um, so, but either way, I, it's, it's hard for me to, and I'm not sure what we would do in the protocol that would make it impossible to do in the future. There's almost nothing you can, I can think of that would make it impossible in the future. I, I just, I just don't think we should consider it, it now, and and we can kick the can down the road if we, on whether we ever do it or not. But um, I certainly don't think we should worry about it now. So I think we're agreeing basically that as long as it's not designed out, it can be kicked down the road, which is fine by me. Um, but I just wanted to contest the point that the different. Um, gatekeepers today or have completely different implementations, therefore it's an impossible problem or it's a hard problem. I, I reckon it's a really easy problem because they all 
um, support a same subset of semantics in terms of having the concept of an admin or uh, for a given group or some kind of interim moderator and um, uh, some basic permissions that those users can do like is the room muted or do you need a particular permission to talk uh, I think um, if you want more sophisticated role-based access control, like say Discord has, then you can get off into a really complicated set. But from our day-to-day -day experience of bridging hundreds of systems already together via matrix, the basic subset of a ranking of access control from like 0 to 100, and you apply different permissions to the different level of power that people have empirically, is enough to map onto everything apart from the Discord role-based access control that we have today. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's impossible, and that's why I think we should try to keep it in, well, it has to be kept um, in scope and not designed out, although I agree that um, you don't need it on day one. So to quickly reinforce what Nancy just said, um, I think the level of agreement we need to be able to interrupt in the first place should be sufficient to also allow portability. I don't think we have to introduce something massively new because of that. And so I also don't really agree that um, the systems of gatekeepers are so different uh, today that that is a problem. They will have to uh, become compatible, obviously, um, in order to interrupt. And again, that, that should be enough uh, to allow portability uh, fundamentally. Is the, is the upshot here that everyone's okay with 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 doing this limit later, and we just need to be on the watch out that we're avoiding creating situations where that's not the case? Is that the bottom line? And then we can, and the, if we have the point where someone is doing something that, the, for instance, Matthew thinks will prevent portability of the future, Matthew says something, and then we argue about it then, or is there something else, some other follow up on that? Uh, the one okay. action that's brewing in the chat is the, to take an inventory of what is currently supported by existing systems, um, which does seem like a useful exercise. Right. Great. Okay. Um, should we move on? Okay. So, so this um, uh, this this is going to be a long, uh, a somewhat long setup. Um, um, that I think um, I'm not sure I'm doing a great job of teeing this team this one up. Um, so I'll try to like um, uh, 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 see if I can frame this and then and then give given an, not may not particularly motivational example and then we can talk about the details. Um, so. Um, the, the, the key point here is that state exists at multiple levels. So as a, as a concrete example, um, you know, you can have the idea of the transport level, which people are in the room. That is to say, when you send a message, who it gets like fanned out to, and there's an MLS level of which keys are in the room. And, um, you know, that is to say, when I encrypt a message, uh, and, and so, so the, the transport information exists to some extent at the services and the, and the, and the, and the key material exists um, some some extent at the endpoints. So I you know I end and encrypt the message. And even if like you know if I think that Richard and Matthew are in the room, and the transport thinks that Richard, Matthew, and Jonathan are in the room, well Jonathan gets a message, but he can't decrypt it, right? Um, and so that's um, and so I think the question becomes you know how tightly in sync these have to be, and they have to be cryptographically connected. Um, and what I mean by that, and this, and this probably is a security question, is it goes to the security properties of the whole system as a whole. Um, so can you can you go to the next slide? So, you know, uh, um, a, a, as a warm-up example, um, you know, if you think about it, um, we, you know, here we have a case where the room membership is constant. So we have Alice and Bob in a room, but Bob gets a new phone. And so he like sends a commit, um, you know, with a new key. Um, and, um, and I don't want to detail how the commit works um, in MLS because I'm, I'm not sure I can reconstruct it right now, but even so it doesn't really matter. And the, and the end result is the room membership hasn't changed. Um, but there's a new, but, but Alice is aware of a new key of Bob's K3, you know, intro and red. Um, so this is an example of a change that exists only really at the MLS layer. Um, uh, next slide. Um, um, conversely, you have a situation where, um, you know, Charlie gets added by the service to, by, by, this, by, by the service um, to a chat. 
Um, and so, you know, and, and so here in, in red, we see just like the ML, there's no MLS change just yet. Um, and, um, you know, so Charlie's got the, what we, you know, what Mark would call the roster. Um, and, um, and then in the next slide, Charlie, you know, Charlie is like a shirtle join as himself the MLS group. And that when Alice and Bob see the external, the external commit, they basically say, well, Charlie's in the chat. Um, and so I ought to like add him to MLS. And so now, now, now you see the two things are synchronized, right? Um, and so um, this is like sort of a naive, um, you know, conceptual, conceptualization. Um, and next slide. Um, but so I think the, the key point here is in the example I just showed, um, you know, um, the endpoints have not actually assent to Charlie being added to the group in any meaningful way. What I mean by that is they just read the roster off of the, um, you know, off, off of the servers. And when Charlie asked, asked to add himself to the group, they were like, looks good to me. And they took the MLS external commit, right? And so, um, and so, and so the question I think becomes, um, is this an acceptable state of affairs? Um, which is, is it acceptable state of affairs to have the meta information which is used to control the MLS. So I mean, the way MLS is designed, right, is you get these messages that say do things, do various group manipulations, and you have some access, some unspecified access control mechanism that says you accept them or reject them. And so, um, and so this, and, and so like the security of MLS is some, some, some outsourced to the access control list. Um, and the MLS just like make sure that things are visible, but it doesn't like, but you know, if, if, if you're told, well, you know, here are some key, which is actually published on the internet, but at it, at it anyway, um, there's nothing like MLS doesn't say what to do about that. About that, about that. And so, um, you know, I think the, the, the question we have at hand is, is, you know, do we want to, you can imagine really a system that was differently constructed where everything was like signed by some group member and that the access control list were also signed by the group member. And, um, um, and, um, and then, so like you would, and, and then, and then, and then, so then that, that would tie together the, the group state and the MLS state, um, or rather the transport state and the MLS state. So I think there was like a number of possibilities, right? Um, you know, um, you know, one is you can like just in this sort of example I gave, you can just trust the service and the service has an access control list. And like, yes, you're aware of who's in the chat, but um, that's control is outsourced to the service. Um, you could have, um, you know, so Jonathan, the, the, um, yes, the commits are signed by the participants who sent them. But the question is, um, but but the question is like, as I said, um, uh, one version of this is that how do I know um, which, uh, which, which changes the group to accept, right? And so as a concrete example, there's a way for Charlie just to add himself to the group by sending his own commit. And, um, and, the, and the reason you accept that is, um, is uh, the slide should be online somewhere. Um, the, the, reason, the, reason, um, the reason you accept that is because there's an access control mechanism which says that Charlie is now part of the group. And so when he asks you to join the group, that's okay. Um, and so, um, so I said, there's like what's so like so the, the easiest possibility is like just have that design where like there's some externalized policy machinery in transport and it's not tied to MLS in any meaningful way. Um, the the um, secondly, you could have a mechanism where we say, well, there is some like, MLS cryptographic way to say what those policies are, uh, but it's not required as part of the system. Um, and um, and finally, you could say, well, um, there's um, uh, um, there's a, 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 an MLS. Um, we actually have MLS specifies the whole thing. Um, so, Jonathan, to, to your point, I don't actually think that's a, that's correct because there are lots of systems where like external entities join, it, it, uh, where where people are not part of the group because add people all the time. Um, you know, this is like how you know, um, um, you know, as a concrete example, this is how like every enterprise messaging system works, where it says like, um, you know, people are just allowed to join groups um, as long as they're in place. Um, so, um, and, um, so, so that's not really, so, so I think that's not like just generally just a viable construct, um, to just say that like the group member, you have to have some group member online to add you. Um, um, uh, so I think like, again, but, um, so I think we have to figure out what we're trying to accomplish here, but, um, uh, but, but I think that like, uh, um, that, that we need to figure out like, is everything have to be tied back to some MLS cryptographic key or not? It is really the key question. Um, I see that we've developed the queue, so I will stop talking. Um, yeah, I think it's absolutely an MLS question at this point. Um, so I think the answer to it is actually fairly simple. Um, yes, everything has to be tied back to MLS in the sense that we need complete agreement uh, among clients on what's acceptable and what's not. So what the policy is, what the ACLs are, uh, whatever we're going to define, and that's completely undefined yet, but whatever it's going to be, uh, at the end of the day, that has to be some sort of an MLS extension. Um, and then we get cryptographic agreement on that. So 
uh, the way it works is that participants can uh, issue commits uh, to the group and those cover proposals and in turn the proposals they can change the group membership meaning alice can add bob for example or remove bob or they can also change um, the extensions so you need complete agreement on whether or not it is okay for alice to add bob to the group now um, and so this needs to be distributed. So whenever somebody joins a group, it needs to be distributed uh, ahead of time. Um, and that's why we have the, uh, the group info object in MLS. Uh, and once you're part of a group and assuming you don't miss any messages, then you, you get these incremental updates that updates your status long, um, along with everybody else's. Um, so yeah, I, I think that should answer your your last question, we, we need to nail it down to something um, that is an MLS extension. And, and then we have like automatical agreement essentially. Right, so um, I, I, you know, I'll pretty much completely agree with what Rafael said. Uh, definitely not just trust the service, right? We want authenticity to be an end-to-end -end property so clients, whatever happens, you know, I, I feel quite strongly that clients should be the ones enforcing the ACL for themselves. Um, I do think also there's a lot of, we, we, we get real mileage out of making this, making ACLs something that ties right into the MLS state itself at a cryptographic layer. Um, I think agreement is important. You know, we don't want to end up in groups where for whatever reasons, bugs, maybe active attacks, whatever, you know, Clients in a group don't even agree on the ACL. I think that's just not a good behavior to have. And by tying the ACL mechanism to the MLS uh, state at a cryptographic layer, we, we, we get this property for free in a sense, because if you don't agree on the ACL, you're not gonna agree on the MLS key and you're just not gonna be able to decrypt each other's stuff. So communication breaks down and that's kind of what we want when we get out of sync like that, I think. Um, and MLS provides us really good mechanisms to do this, to do ACLs and to tie them in. You know, MLS has that, has all the, the bells and whistles built in for us to do that. So I'm quite strongly in favor of, of three here, require MLS, um, you know, and, and require ACL, like that ties into the cryptographic state at the MLS layer. Um, so I, I, I don't agree with that because I actually think it's dangerous to view this as a protocol problem. I actually think it's a user interface problem. And so let, let's say for the moment we added some ACL thing to MLS and everyone has to agree on it. What user interface are you going to show to a user that joins a group? Are you going to do a screen pop and says the access control policy for this group is, you know, only accept members from, you know, only people currently in the group can authorize members or the, the service running this this capability is able to add members if they're behest or whatever. Like we're going to pop that to a user. 100% of users will not understand and click OK. And my worry is if you do that, then you introduce an easy vector for people to introduce access control policies, which are the service provider can add participants. As soon as we have that policy, I think a lot of the promises and, and benefits that MLS brings to the table are just evaporated and with them, just a puff of smoke. So I, I think you need like a like we're going to keep this simple use, you know, we're not relying on user experience for people to make sure the ACL is good. We're just going to have an ACL that is default and, and for MLS purposes, for, sorry, for Mimi purposes. I mean, MLS can add it for other use cases, but I think for, you know, for this, at least, like, I think it has to be something that just baked in and just works and doesn't invite a recipe for disaster. I do think as a conclusion that would, rule out the ability of someone to just join a group without being invited. If we want to do that, we would have to add primitives at the transfer protocol, which ultimately we do, we result in a MLS primitive, which is someone in the group has to approve it and therefore they would send a commit uh, and everyone would accept the commit becomes, because it comes from an existing member. That's, that's at least my view on this. Thank you. Um, so yeah. I, get, I, think, I think I was next actually. Um, sorry, then go but ahead. No worries, it's, it's interface is impossible. <laughs> um, um, I think I think we may have to say some more things too, um, uh, which is 
Um, I don't think anybody's assuming that controllers would be enforced by humans. I think they're assuming that controllers would be enforced by software. And so the software would say, you know, if the, if a person, anybody who's like first name starts with A wants to join, then just go ahead and accept their external commit, um, external join. Um, um, I guess, um, you know, Jonathan, I, I do agree that there's like, it is, is it, in many cases an unattractive property to a lot of the system to add new members to the group. Um, um, but it is also like an essential property, uh, um, but it's, it's also an essential property in like every message, every enterprise system I'm aware of. Um, so like I said, in Slack, for instance, like anybody in, anybody in Slack can like join public groups. Right. And so, um, so you need some way to indicate the group that, that, you, that, that when you receive an external join from, um, from a, uh, from, from someone who's part of your company that you should accept, that, that your software should accept that. Um, and I, I just don't think it's a sensible like apparatus to have, um, and then there's no tech to, and there's no like security difference between that policy and the policy of if you receive an external transfer of a message as for someone in your company asking to join, then you should send a commit adding them. Those are the same thing from MLS perspective. I mean, not the same MLS mechanic, but the same MLS security guarantee. And so I just don't think it makes sense to sort of, if, if we're going to allow that policy at all, then the policy should be accepted external join, not like someone gets summoned, like to randomly add to randomly do a commit because you were permitted. Um, so I think, I guess what I, well, I think the same. Th so I think that, and as soon as you have two access control policies, then you need that. Then you need some language for defining access control policies. So I think what this comes down to is we're going to need effectively. What I think I heard Raphael and Joel, and Joel saying is we need some MLS extension that lets you define access control policies, even if they are in fact very simple. Um, yeah, good points. I think there is a big misunderstanding here, uh, Jonathan. Um, so it, this doesn't mean that uh, a user or a human, uh, like Eckert just said, needs to approve anything. So if we have a policy figured out that, for example, allows anyone uh, to join a room, um, the, the only requirement here is that all the clients know about this policy. And then you can do what's called an external commit in MLS, and then you can just join a group. But again, it comes down to specifying what that policy is, and then it will be enforced automatically. It doesn't require any sort of human interaction uh, at that level. So it's, in a way, you can think of it as uh, like a, a cryptographic enforcement of what used to be plain text ACLs uh, in messaging systems previously. It does not uh, prevent you from doing anything in that sense. It only means that uh, there's strong agreement on everything you do. And I think in, in practical terms, it's going to be a lot more robust uh, because you have this agreement, like Joel pointed out earlier. Uh, if if the agreement is not there, you cannot decrypt messages anymore, and that's probably what you want. Yeah, I I guess I wanted to add to, to, um, to respond to what Jonathan was saying. What I was saying was agnostic to you know the particulars of how we how we what we allow in terms of flexibility for the acl in fact when i when i was talking what i had in mind was we're going to define a basic acl and that's it and that'll be the once and for all acl not everybody gets to define their own acl per group and that has to be displayed to users when they join nothing like that i mean that also works with what i was saying but i didn't even have that in mind i was just thinking you know whatever mimi decides is the right access control model we should implement that at the MLS level so that it gets enforced by the MLS protocol library already. And the cryptography is, is you know, is going to go awry if members of a group don't agree on, on, on what the ACL is anymore. Like that, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that, you know, there should be flexibility in defining different ACLs. That, I agree, that, that's, that is a bit of a UX nightmare right there. Ah, uh, so thank you, Joel. That's super helpful. That, that that I think is actually the source of the disconnect because I thought the only re it, I thought the proposal was we need an ACL language in MLS because we want to allow for variability in the ACL from group to group, which is the thing that I'm strongly opposing. If you're saying no, 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 you don't understand. Like MLS will pick one, and it's just there's a bug or a missing feature in MLS, and we don't have a way for everyone to know what that is. Like I feel I okay. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Um, as long as that's what we're agreeing, like that that we're not going to allow for variability in access control policies here, um, are we? Right. So Matthew says, "What's the point if it's hard coded?" Okay, so we still have a discussion. 
The point is to uh, catch bugs. The point is to ensure that any kind of disagreement like can't go, you can't go anywhere with disagreement because you're not even going to agree on the cryptographic keys anymore. It, it won't catch everything, but it'll catch some things. Yeah, so I, um, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I was I so I was sitting here thinking I, I I had missed that it was it was just one and I was wondering if uh, just having one is really going to accommodate the use cases that people had been contemplating thus far in the discussion. Um, and it, it wasn't even obvious to me if there was just going to be one. What is it going to be? Is it going to be anybody who's in the group can authorize another joiner? And if it's not that, then what is it? Or do we actually need to have, like, say, between one and three different options here? Yes, yeah, so as I said, I just don't see how you can not how you can not have more than one option, because we know for a fact there are two different at least two different major configurations. One of which is any new any group member can add a new member, and one of which is that any person who's already in existence can join. And so, um, so those are two options. And there's probably at least a third, which is only administrators can add a new member. And so, like it, like much as people might wish to have only one option, I do not say that as possible. I do think there is some misunderstanding here, um, as if we have to choose between. Um, the authentication guarantees that MLS gives us and something else. Um, at the end of the day, MLS can do whatever you want in that sense. If, if you want a setup where anyone can join, and I'm making this up now, that has a certain domain in their email address, uh, because that's a rule uh, for, for that particular group, um, then you can use external commits in MLS, which does not rely on anyone inviting you. You can just join. Um, and, and that's just going to work, uh, essentially, because all of the clients know about this particular rule uh, for that group, and then they're going to enforce it. And if um, and the other thing that I forgot to mention earlier is that we don't actually necessarily have to rely only on the clients to enforce this, because we might say that it's, it's a bit late. You know, if something reaches a client that that might be spam, like a malicious uh, message where Alice adds Bob and that's then invalid. We can stop that at the server level as well. So in the three proposals we currently have for the delivery service and the transport, all of them essentially would allow inspection at the server level, whether or not a certain message is valid, uh, a particular commit. So whether that is a, a new user joining an existing group or a user inviting someone uh, to a group or uh, a user adding an extra device, um, as long as, as this is well defined, then um, we can stop that on the server uh, early on. So I, I still do not understand what the difference between one, two, and three is. Uh, because for me, whatever we're going to agree on, um, it, it will be baked into the MLS level uh, authentication anyway. We did say I wasn't sure how I framed this. Um, uh, um, uh, um, so I think, uh, um, but but I think I think we are closing into what I would uh, what I would claim is is three, which is there is some MLS attribute that says what the policy is that you're supposed to accept supposed to apply when you receive an extra an external commit um, or other or other message, and that is attached to the group and and, and bound into it in the way that you and Joel were, were indicating. So I think it's possible that Jonathan and I have the, continue to have the same uh, confusion, which is, you know, based on what Raphael just said, like, how does that translate into facilitating interop at the application layer for these different systems? I understand you can support anything in MLS, but like then when it comes time to trying to have a consistent user experience across interoperating systems, like how does that that boundless set of possibilities get reduced to something which is 
which you can actually implement uh, such that you get a, the same experience regardless of, of which system you're using. Um, maybe I can take this one quickly. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the problem as such is still unsolved in the sense that it's a charter question now, whether or not we need to recharter um, uh, to have ACLs and, and policy and moderation uh, as part of the scope. But it's orthogonal to MLS in that sense. Um, if we want interop on that level, um, we need to specify that. And again, whatever is the outcome of that specification process, can then you know just get ratified by MLS additionally. My worry, is uh, right? as far as the charter is concerned. Okay, I think I think I'm next. So, my worry is all of this discussion on MLS protocol stuff reduces this to a previously unsolved problem which is what I'm saying is like, let's, let's be clear on where this policy would come from. So let's think about it from a user experience perspective. I'm going to be on a provider. I'm going to create a, a chat room and that'll happen long before Mimi is involved, right? I create this room and let's say I select this as a moderated room and only people, you know, that only people in the group can invite other people. And in fact, I'm going to elect two admins who are the only ones who are allowed to do that. They're going to do that through a UI, in their system, on their service, and the, and the APIs and the, and the UI for doing that are all going to create that rule, and that's going to be created on the server, like that. And and thus, the only way, I, unless I'm missing something here, like that act to turn that into an MLS ACL means that the server has to pass the ACL to the client. And as soon as you do that, then I worry the server is going to say he he he, and also allow you know, bad guy, eavesdropper, government to add participants to the room too. And that's going to be the policy that comes down. So like, and, and if to say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to, we're just going to have the UI for policy manipulation be done entirely client side without the server rendered or server APIs is like nonsense. I mean, no system works that way. So I just don't see practically how you have a real system that constructs an Apple where the Apple doesn't come from the service. And then I can answer that system. if you'd like. Sure. Jonathan, would you like me to answer that? Go ahead, Rowan. Play with this yeah. Um, so the, the the way this works is a cooperative, verifiable system between the servers and the clients. So. Presumably, when a client creates the, a, a group, it's going to use a set of policy policies that are allowed already by, like, here are the choices of policy constraints that you can put in place that are presented by its server. And then its server, you know, says, okay, you can have an open group, you can have a, you can have a, you know, a group that has admins, you can have a one-on-one -on -one group. And the client says, great, I want to do an admin group. And I want to set these users as the admins. And so it goes and takes the policy that is allowed. It sets a policy that's compliant with that. It sticks it in the MLS group. It Everybody else, as they're added, before they even accept, they get to know what the policy is. And they can choose to say, yes, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to be in a group that has that policy or not, uh, which would be, you know, presumably done automatically by their client. Um, and the, the servers all get, the servers that are involved all can sort of see what's going on. Um, if we make this, if this policy object is, is sent in commits and commits are unencrypted, which most implementations are doing that because they need that in order to do external commits and other things. So, uh, no contradiction here, just that. The clients all get to see cryptogra uh, cryptographically verified that this was, a, this was a policy that was placed by the creator or that was later modified by one of the 
authorized users, and they get to cry foul if something is wrong. The servers also get to see it, and presumably where this all came from was the server on the owning, you know, the, the owning server told the, you know, told the creator at some point, like, this is the kind of thing that you are, these are the things you are allowed to do. And all of these authorization rules, you know, they already, there's a set of these which already exist. So the semantics are pretty well understood. We just need to write them down into, in, into a concrete syntax and stick them in one of these extensions. All right. Somebody please mute me and unhand me. So I don't crash my... Jonathan, do you have any response to that? You're still in the queue. Also, still in the queue. So um, Ma Matthew sort of is getting to the point where I I'm getting to. He said in the chat, like, "Hey, but Matrix today effectively lets you define the actors on the client, and they're signed and authorized by other instances, whatever. You don't need a server." I get that. If you design a greenfield system, I can imagine how you could build a greenfield system that had this property that the effectively the ACL was only ever built by the client and the created by the client without depending on the server. But uh, I'd be shocked if this is true for any of the existing systems that we're trying to federate. All of these are going to start, I presume, with the moderation rules and access control rules defined on the server. And thus the only way for for this to sort of like interoperate with the you know with the current systems is the server is going to have to hand the client uh, the rules for it to construct the access control list. Um, and I just think that that introduces a security vulnerability that I'm worried about. Right. Should I go ahead or? Yeah, go ahead, Joy. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so basically I, I, I have the same view as Rowan does, right? And to Jonathan's point here, you know how the room gets set up. That's that's between the client and 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 its local like vendor, and and it, they got to negotiate like, okay, what ACLs can I use, and you know who can I add, stuff like that. But eventually, it's got to it's got to decide on something. It's got to reach some point of view of like, okay, this is what the group's going to look like. This is what the ACL is going to look like. At that point, it creates the MLS group, and then it can put whatever it ended landed on into this part of the state of the MLS group, at which point it then signs that state. And that's the end of any chance of the vendor interjecting or modifying anything, right? Because now it's signed by this user who's creating the group. And, and now it becomes an end-to-end -end thing. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing around this, this sort of, you know, this, this um, like uh, the, the meta, the meta, I like that term, Matthew. Um, to me, this is like, a spe this is like, basically like modality. It's the same thing we're talking about is how we want to deal with modality of rooms. Right? So it's the same conversations. And and yeah, to me personally, it makes sense to maybe define a couple like, um, you know, an unmoderated room and a moderated room. I'm not sure we, you know, really need anything more than that. Some sort of common denominators, one, two, three modes, some, not more than that. And that's it. And that's, that's, what, that's what people got to support. And, and that's it. Not, not, not anything more flexible than that, because then it's just going to become a nightmare, and then I mean, it's just too, too complicated of a UX problem. So that's maybe what needs to be negotiated at the beginning with the vendor, you know, with your with your own uh, local host or, or whatever. Yeah, that's that's how I would basically imagine this to work. Um, I don't know if that sort of addresses the security problem, or I, I'd be interested, Jonathan, in understanding more about that security issue. With that in mind, what with this description in mind that, that you're concerned with. Um, yeah, I would also like to understand more about what the potential security problem is here. But if it is that um, clients can now dictate to a provider what the policy is, and that's not the case because they don't get to create a group if, if they don't abide by whatever the vendor uh, thinks the, the policy should be. And the so the only thing here is that once that is negotiated, as Ralph said, 
um, vendors or providers cannot as easily or not at all actually inject anything anymore and the whole thing becomes really transparent um, so uh, and, and Tim just wrote whether uh, it's now a question that ACLs are expressed cryptographically at the MLS layer so the ACLs they can still be plain text but they essentially just you know get hashed into the MLS key material and then signed um, so that's how it's binding for everybody um, but we, we don't need to do anything fancy for the SELs except for clearly defining what they are and making them available uh, to everyone, which we need to do anyway, regardless of MLS or not. That, um, as um, Jonathan says, that like groups are going to have some, um, you know, uh, some dictation of what the policy is from the uh, fr from the vendor um, from the, the, the owning server. And I think if you just think about something like Slack, right? As I said, there are two main policies in Slack. One is anyone can join a, a public group, and one is that only that, that um, only members, uh, you know, members have to add, admit new members um, at a private group, right? And so I could certainly, you know, I could certainly see a situation where um, you know, where Slack binds. You know, two different access control policies, and when and when the uh, when the group is created, um, you know, uh, the uh, clients are told which access control policy applies to it, um, and those would be and then that's something you expect the client to enforce. And the client would in fact show, you know, this is a private group, this is a public group, and a, and a public group has the property that anyone can add it. Um, I, I agree that like if you allow public groups, there's no there's no there's like always a, there's always a, a possibility that like um, you know um, uh, uh, that that. Uh, that the provider will add somebody, which is like in many cases undesirable. Um, but I think the purpose of, uh, of the discussion here is to make that manifest at, at the client and at the cryptographic layer as well. Um, I wonder if there's a case again where like maybe we need a, a kind of a proposal from somebody. Um, let, let me try and describe this specific thread. I, I think I've not done a good job. So let me put it in attack terms. So let's say you have a malicious provider. So my, my provider is malicious and its main goal is it wants to add, you know, make sure that like uh, it, it can uh, have an access control rule, which says add my eavesdropper participant to all rooms, which is the big thing we want to avoid. So the malicious provider wants to do that. So my worry is I, as a user, I'm a customer of this malicious provider. Um, there's an existing room in the system. Um, and so I add a participant now outside of my provider which is where we begin the Mimi experience. Uh, in this proposal, what, you know, because what will happen is that th this room has existed for a while. It has an access control policy, which is say moderated with two admins in it that is not, that is, is known and stored on the provider. Like that's, that's how my mobile app works, like or my web app works. It goes to the server and it gets the data for the group, which includes these policies here, right? Um, and so in this case, what happens is I, um, the provider hands my client the policy and then my client just converts that to this ACL, signs this ACL and, and includes it in MLS and propagates it to other participants in the system. And the malicious provider can therefore just, because we're not rendering this ACL to the user, which is what I just heard, you know, specifically in MLS or asking us to prove it, it's invisible to anyone in the group that the access control policy allows for the addition of this. Everyone is going to approve the addition of this eavesdropper into the room. Um, that's the that's a security threat that I'm I'm worried about. Honestly, um, so um, um, so I think like first of all, like there's no reason for the for some user to like bless like the access control list. Um, that, that, um, you know, that's not the way you build it. Um, 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 uh, but I mean, as I say, the point is for the, for, for this policy manifest to the, so, 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 so there's a, there's a different question between whether or not the users visit, whether the access control list is visible to the users, then as opposed to whether the access control list is enforced by the users. And so, as I said, if you look at Slack, they have public chats and private chats, and you can tell what kind of chat you are because it's got like an icon next to it. And so that's the thing the user has to be aware of. What the users not have to be aware of is when is when someone attempts to join the group, they don't have to like mechanically themselves enforce whether a new person led to join the group or not. Um, but um, uh, and, and like 
and, and so, yeah. And so like, could the provide, could you design a system where the provider was allowed to change um, chats from private to public? Um, I think that depends on the design, if you look at the matrix design, probably not, if you look at other designs, maybe yes. Um, but like, um, you know, it's just inherent in the possibility of having public groups that you have like, um, th that you have the ability to prior to add people as public groups. And so the best we can do make these either. And so unless you're saying you can't have public groups, which means you can't, you can't build Slack and you can't build teams, um, then what you're saying is that then, then you have to have some way of indicating which it is. And the best you can do is make the user available, aware of what kind of group it is. And maybe, and maybe have a ratchet so it can't be changed. I think what we, we need here is a draft, or maybe more than one draft. <laughs> People have different opinions. But I was just going to ask if anybody is already working on such a thing in, M in MLS, um, and if not, if somebody wants to. Um, because I think that's we need to kind of spec out what this looks like uh, to progress the discussion here, I think. Okay, don't all raise hands at once. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, again, I don't think it's it's specific to MLS here. Um, all it needs is something that can be serialized, <laughs> and we agree on the serialization format, and then we put that into an MLS extension. But other than that, it's completely orthogonal to MLS. That's fine. I'm looking for like a volunteer who's going to do some work so that we can have like something to look at in terms of the actual functionality that that the applications will will be built on. So well, that's I'm going to try to something up. Okay. Thank you. And we close the queue, so I'll turn back to Tim. Oh, okay, sort of threw me under the bus there. Uh, okay, so yeah, we're at the end of our time today. Um, so I think we're not going to have time to get to like the last topic uh, in Ecker's deck. Um, so this and I were discussing though the possibility of setting up, uh, I guess, uh, more of these interim sessions, uh, possibly on as much as a weekly cadence, um, so that we can continue getting through these topics and other stuff. Because uh, Raphael, I know that you also had a deck that you uh, shared with us today, which we didn't have time to get to. Um, sorry, Conrad, I see your question in the chat. Uh, Ecker volunteered to do a draft. Uh, so I think watch out for a word from the chairs on the list. Uh, yeah, we're going to set up, uh, I guess, more recurring interims so that we can keep talking about all this stuff. I would be interested in, in people's reaction to that, but I feel like we have, this is, this is helpful. It's like at the beginning of the two hours, we're like, are we, are we really gonna spend two hours on this? And like, lo and behold, we don't even get through it all. So, um, so I think it, it is helping us. And um, we had a little bit of delay getting the first one scheduled after Yokohama, but with, we can do two weeks notice um, for the next one and, you know, schedule a bunch of these out further in advance and then if we don't, if we come to a week when we don't need one, we can always cancel. So that's kind of my inclination on the scheduling. Yeah, Raphael just raised a good point. Maybe, uh, how do we feel about weekly versus bi-weekly? Okay, I'm seeing... Okay. Biweekly, a, a rough consensus, as the phrase goes, uh, behind biweekly. Okay, and I think we'll keep it this time, um, unless anybody has super strong objections. But we did a doodle, and this looked like a, a good time. So, yes, every two weeks, Richard. All right, well, if somebody wants to write a draft that clearly defines semi and bi-weekly, we can hash that out in a different working group. Um, 
Okay. Uh, I think that's it for today. Uh, thanks very much to all the presenters and to everyone for a very stimulating discussion. Yeah, thanks. And Conrad, if you can upload your um, notes into the pad uh, or whatever it's called, the hedge doc, um, that would be great. And they'll, they'll make it into the data tracker that way. Thank you for taking notes. Yeah, thanks again.